Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the chairmanship. Um, you and I have worked together on a number of things in the past, and I look forward to uh, doing so in the future. Uh, for those of us who watch this committee, uh, changes are inevitable on the committee, but uh, we have a process in place for uh, seamless transition. There is there is nothing more uh, nonpartisan and bipartisan than the uh, national interests and the national security of the United States of America. And this. Uh, this committee certainly uh, leads us forward in that regard. Uh, together, uh, we'll move that forward and appreciate working with you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, thank you for uh, having this hearing today. And, uh, it is the United States' interest to promote economic freedom, which lifts hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and achieves uh, shared uh, prosperity. It is also in our strategic interest to protect economic freedom from encroachment by authoritarian regimes that seek to undermine free markets. That is why in 2018, Congress authorized the creation of the Development Finance Corporation, an agency with unique authorities to make development finance more efficient, effective, and impactful. I, I am concerned, however, about uh, DFC's ability to balance its dual mandate to advance and protect economic uh, freedom, particularly when this administration uh, at times seeks to use uh, the, the DFC to promote its agenda. At times, it appears some people have forgotten that development is even in the name. It comes as no surprise that the administration and many of my colleagues are eager to put DFC resources to work in specific regions, favored countries, or hand-picked uh, sectors. But the DFC cannot be everything to everyone all at once. The DFC can play an important role with many other U.S. government agencies in an overall strategy of countering China. But the DFC cannot save the world on its own. The DFC's mission is market-oriented development. Too many mandates imposed by Congress uh, or the administration will st strangle this mission. Flexibility is key here. The DFC's success depends on its ability to find willing private sector borrowers with good projects in developing countries. The more policy writers Congress or the administration forces on DFC, the harder it will be for the DFC <laughs> to find those partners. Repeated efforts to launch uh, investments in high-income countries invite rightful skepticism toward the DFC's commitment to maintaining a development focus. U.S. taxpayers should not be subsidized in rich countries who have the money to pay for their own policy priorities. Nowhere is the abandonment of DFC's uh, foundational principles more evident than in the energy sector. Instead of listening to what developing countries want and need, the administration is pushing a zero carbon mandate uh, that will fail to close the energy gap and will only push, push other countries closer to China and Russia who do not impose those mandates. However, it is, uh, and moreover, it is outrageous that the agency would rely so heavily upon solar energy projects built on the backs of Uyghur slave labor. There is no place for slave labor in any DFC-supported projects, indeed for anything that the United States touches, including solar supply chains. The United States cannot compromise its values to achieve messaging related climate objectives and must continue to make it clear that forced labor is unacceptable. With that being said, there are plenty of opportunities to enhance the DFC's work through creative legislative fixes. I'm eager to hear from the DFC on what it needs to succeed in, achi in achieving its mission. Thank you.